Welcome everyone to the National World War II Museum podcast, World War II on topic. This season is dedicated to Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project. I'm Jason Dawsey, research historian at the museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. I'm just delighted to be joined again by my friend and colleague in the Institute, Dr. John Curatola, military historian. John, great to see you again. Great to be here again, Jason. This is episode four, the final episode of this season of World War II on topic, and we're dealing with the incredibly complex issue, the legacies of the Manhattan Project in the atomic bomb. In episode two, John and I had covered a lot of ground related to the Christopher Nolan film Oppenheimer. We're gonna follow up on some loose ends from that film and push this whole discussion forward into the 1950s, well into the 1950s. So, John, with this, we talked in episode two about a series of issues related to the Nolan film, Oppenheimer. And in the meantime, this film has really become a phenomenon. I mean, billions of people are are going to see it, and there's this huge discussion that's kind of built up around the movie. So maybe a few things to to add on to that to complement what we already did. And the first one really gets to the issue about something we can't really resolve here, which is that there's going to be debate about the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That, that, that debate will be an endless part of American public life because the stakes were so high. World War II in the Pacific ended less than a week after the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. No further action against Imperial Japan was necessary after August 15th, an invasion with all the fears about enormous American casualties, that did not have to happen. And yet, the new weapons killed, really, we could argue about numbers, is it 100,000 to 200,000, mostly Japanese civilians, including the elderly women and children, and it killed them in really inhuman ways. There's a new form of mass death. You could talk about dying from radiation poisoning is something really uh, something really novel that comes out of this. So that debate is never going to, to, uh, to conclude. It's going to always, I think, be with us. But in addition to that, the Manhattan Project and the atomic bombs did not just end a war. They began fundamentally new eras in human history. They were part of the development of the Cold War and became the most dangerous aspect of this conflict. And we can really say depending how you want to date it, roughly the Cold War ended around 1990. The other thing that these weapons began was the atomic age, which endures, is very much still with us. So in following up on what we did with episode two, John, why don't we talk about, and I know something you're very interested in, how Americans, how did the American public view the use of little boy and fat man? What can we say about that? Yeah, it's interesting uh, when you look at the, the perspective of, of the average American. And in August of 1945, there's a Gallup poll. Uh, and it, it, it says basically 85% of the American population approved uh, of the use of the weapons, 10% did not, and then basically 5% abstained uh, from the survey itself. Uh, so there's overwhelming support you know, for the use of these weapons uh, in August of 1945. What's interesting to note, though, in the months subsequent to the dropping, that 85% number drops down to 65%. Um, there's kind of a, a realization here or um, an accounting for what occurred uh, with the dropping of those two weapons. Now, keep in mind, the context is very different. And, and as you pointed out in your uh, initial comments, the war is over now. And so now there's time for introspection and review uh, uh, of the war itself and puts it in the past as opposed to the present. Um, and so there is a little bit of, of uh, recognition that maybe this wasn't a good thing. Uh, still, 65% is still obviously the vast majority of people, but there is some now thought given to this idea. And it's reflected in many of the thinkers, many of the scientists, and many of the scholars subsequent to the war that kind of have these long range concerns over, over our uh, ability to uh, enact fission. That's a terrific place to begin. These, these perceptions that Americans have 
that initially are enormously positive, and that's not really a surprise. The war, World War II did end, this conflict with some 60 million people killed in it, this fear, especially after Okinawa, about what a ground invasion, you know, what, what an invasion, an amphibious operation, invasion and occupation of Japan, just what would be involved with that, and that does not have to occur, and yet already there's these signs of concern about the fact that the atomic bomb was much more than about just defeating Japan. It's now this, it's out there, it's in the world. And just to mention a kind of few examples and, and to complement, augment what John just said, Norman Cousins, who's the editor of the Saturday Review of Literature, been a strong supporter of Franklin D. Roosevelt, New Dealer. He publishes this article, John, on August 18th, with the title, Modern Man is Obsolete. Mm -hmm. He follows that up with a book with the same title, a short book that came out with Viking just that fall. Cousins is only 30 years old. He's a very young man. Um, In the article and book, he doesn't really get into the issue about was using atomic bombs the right thing to do? Was it necessary? Was it unavoidable? He doesn't really focus on that. He's really thinking about what does this mean, the introduction of these weapons, these super weapons for the future, not only of Americans, but of human beings. And he actually has some very startling things to say. He talks about the fact that what they could mean is the complete obliteration of the human species. That's one of the phrases that he uses. And he he will call for something like world government, John, to confront the fact that now, look, fission is the reality. It's no longer theory. Things have now progressed where we can see what these weapons can do. They can destroy entire cities, one weapon. And so he'll talk about some kind of international control and that countries, including the U.S., will have to cede some degree of national sovereignty in order to ensure that the bomb doesn't uh, destroy us. Is what I'll say. And then just a couple of other examples, I think, for our audience, for them to be aware of. That's 1945, Cousins. 1946, and I'm John, you're interested in this as well. John Hersey mm-hmm. has this work appears first with the New Yorker, and then it comes out in book form where he has interviewed six people, six survivors of the attack on Hiroshima, and he writes up their stories. The book appears as... Hiroshima and sells something like 300,000 copies right away, signaling that the American public is really not only curious, but concerned and and wants information. And in fact, that there are stories of of people from Japan. We have a case of a woman, Toshiko Sasaki, who was a a clerk. She had been wounded during the, the attack. There's also uh, Kiyoshi Tanamoto, who was a pastor at a Methodist church. Their stories are told in this particular book. And so it does. It generates a lot of discussion in the country. I think we could, third and final example of this, we could say, and please add whatever you want here. John, is 1947, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists is founded, connected to the University of Chicago. Uh, Hyman Goldsmith and Eugene Rabinowitz are the two f- key figures in setting up this periodical. Still very much out there with us today. And what they do, in addition to this, the, the coverage about, if you will, the, the nuclear question, which we'll see steady coverage of right up until our own time, is something called the Doomsday Clock. Mm-hmm. And then most Americans have heard of the Doomsday Clock, really letting us know what the bulletin thinks in terms of how close are we to the edge, to the cliff's edge? How close are we to this scenario of, of human extinction that Cousins was so concerned with, with already in 1945? And I thought I'd just let our viewers uh, know that as of this year, 2023, the bulletin has moved the clock to 90 seconds to midnight, mm-hmm. which is the closest to global catastrophe it has ever been by their estimation. So there is all this apprehension within the country 
as well. Anything you wanted to add to that, John, just about Americans' perceptions of the weapons? Yeah, what you see, you know, subsequent to the war, um, it, that America is kind of re reflecting uh, on this act. Um, and one of the military thinkers at the time, a gentleman by the name of Bernard Brody, uh, is going to publish a book in 1946 uh, called The Absolute Weapon. And in this book, he, he's bringing up many of the same issues that you, you address, but he says something very important here, and it kind of carries uh, some of the tone and temperament of this time. And he, and he writes, so far the chief purpose of our military establishment has, to been, has been to win wars. From now, its chief, chief purpose must be to avert them. It can almost have no other useful purpose. And so given this statement, uh, most of the, your military planners subsequent to 1945 looked upon future war as something that's going to be air-centric, and it's going to be based upon the use of, of fission weapons. Uh, the Army Air Corps, or, or Army Air Forces, which becomes the U.S. Air Force in 1947, is already looking at the idea of flying over the polar ice caps with uh, intercontinental bombers, the, the B-36, which is this huge uh, legacy of the, first, of the Second World War. Uh, it's not used during World War II, but it's kind of a, a legacy airframe um, that will fly from bases in Alaska and the northern states over the polar ice caps and strike uh, Russian cities uh, uh, in the next war. And this kind of serves as the blueprint uh, for American military strategy subsequent to the war. As a matter of fact, there's a, a number of studies done within Congress over there, where should we be putting our, our defense dollars? Uh, and up into 1947, 1948, uh, the defense budget for the new national military establishment, which becomes Department of Defense, okay, um, they pretty much give a, a third uh, to each one of the military services, a third to the Army Air Forces, a third to the Army, and a third to the Navy. But this starts being called into question. Uh, with this idea of an air-centric warfare, the Air Force sees itself more and more as the relevant force in the contemporary environment as opposed to the old notions of warfare. Um, and as a result, it's going to clamor for more of the, of the budgetary pie. And this really becomes an issue not only within the national military establishment, but also within the halls of Congress over where should America be putting its defense dollars. And so you even have a debate within the military establishment itself uh, about the use of, of nuclear weapons in the future. This debate that's kindled in 1945-46, Oppenheimer really gives us a lot of insight. If we can come back to the mm -hmm. film. Sure. A, a lot of insight about how serious the repercussions are taken and what it's going to mean for all sorts of people, not least uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Just kind of building on what you said, John, Oppenheimer is one of those individuals speaking of averting war, mm -hmm. this Brody comment, that Oppenheimer really thought the bombs, they had ended the war. And we even have interviews with him with CBS News in 1965, where he's saying, look, of course I have regrets about the deaths of Japanese civilians. How could I not? Mm -hmm. But he'll say, I didn't see any other course of action but that one. So he still will stand behind his role, the Manhattan Project's role in ending World War II, as late as 20 years later, he dies in 1967. But he does believe that it will prevent future wars. It will force nations, right, to confront the fact that, that war, that armed conflict has to end now, that we have to move into a new era of arbitration and conflict resolution and, and dare one say it, peace or peacefulness between nations and that's his vision and he sticks with that for for many years and I think that does feed into a lot of his concerns about the hydrogen bomb. We touched on some of this in episode right. two about the hydrogen bomb, much less the idea of of ICBM, so mm -hmm. being able to uh, hit targets on the other side of the planet within a matter of minutes. Yeah, I think reflective of, of that concern, what happens uh, in the United States uh, in the spring of 1945, you know, they, they put together what's called this interim committee uh, that uh, serves an advisory panel for Truman as he gets read in on the Manhattan Project because obviously he doesn't know anything about it until FDR dies. Um, and this interim committee, the, the name is intentional because it's not intended to be a standing uh, organization. It's there to help the president 
uh, and advise him with regard to nuclear technology. After the war, uh, we established what's called the Atomic Energy Commission in 1947. This is the formal standing organization that they were thinking of in 1945. And what is it? It's, it's run by civilians. It is placing the fissionable materials uh, in the hands of civilian authority, not in the hands of military authority. And this is done deliberately. Uh, even though the Manhattan Project was under military auspices, all of those uh, assets were transferred over the Atomic Energy Commission with the military actually on the outside looking in uh, to the Atomic Energy Commission. And it establishes a rather interesting relationship between the military and the AEC. As a matter of fact, it's an adversarial one. Um, the AEC doesn't trust the military and the military doesn't trust the Atomic Energy Commission. And it gets into a really ugly food fight uh, between these two entities. Um, there's a great uh, quote. Uh, the first chair of the Atomic Energy Commission is a guy by the name of David Lilienthal. And his relationship with the military is that he, he is surprised, I'm going to paraphrase it very poorly, he's surprised at the bloodthirsty comments that the military uses so easily shocks him. Um, and the best way to kind of uh, articulate this relationship is that the AEC thought the military guys were all fools and the military guys thought the AEC were all crooks, quote unquote. Um, and so you actually have, subsequent to the war, a dysfunction uh, within the United States. Despite the fact that we have this monopoly, there is a complete dysfunction of the, of the American uh, atomic enterprise, say from 1946 to 1950. Uh, and of course, one of the things that spurs this change, as you mentioned, is the hydrogen bomb. Uh, by 1949, most uh, uh, military planners have realized, hey, you know, we only have a limited amount of bombs. That, that number is still classified, by the way, how, how many bombs we actually had. Um, there's speculation as to how many. Um, but we need to step up our atomic uh, effort because it kind of falls by the wayside after the war because everybody goes home. Um, and when the Soviets uh, explode Joe 1, uh, that's a shockwave, uh, especially to the atomic enterprise, thinking maybe we need to spur the building of more fissionable weapons. But also, what about fusion? This is no longer just um, a, a scientific possibility. It's something that, that might necessarily be in the realm of reality. And so this idea of fission weapons really has an effect on Oppenheimer, and the members of the advisory committee to the Atomic Energy Commission. And you can read their report. Um, you can go into the archives and read their response to the leadership of, of the Atomic Energy Commission that basically says, look, we, we would like to pursue fusion technology as a scientific experiment. However, we don't see the need to build a fusion bomb. The, the problem with that is, Anytime you're going to pursue that scientific course of action, of course it can be moved into, you know, atomic or to a, a weapon of war. And so this is, again, as we talked about last time, this is the line that he's straddling as a man of science. But by the same token, this science can easily be used for fissionable weapons. And it's guys uh, like Louis Strauss um, that and Brian McMahon of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy that really pushed the development of fusion weapons. And so what you see is this kind of transition from uh, this, hey, uh, questioning of atomic weapons subsequent to the war to now that the Soviets have them, we need to put more and more bombs and more and more of our defensive posture into nuclear weapons. Yeah, there's, there's so much there that you, you brought in. And I think just to pull together some of that, I think for our, our audience to remember all the things we've been talking about, these this this fear, that we can really talk about a kind of nuclear fear mm. that does begin to uh, to grow in the U.S. and will become an international phenomenon. This is even before the Soviets, quote, get the bomb mm. in 1949. I think... Figures like Oppenheimer and others realize this: the science is out there. That um, we mentioned this in episode two. The Soviets are going to get the bomb. What's to prevent other countries right. from from getting the bomb? So what you have it, you're kind of pointing to John is this interesting dynamic where the Manhattan Project is is really about weaponizing this scientific revolution, the yes. scientific breakthrough, right? 
that had come about. It had its origins in the early 20th century. And then 1938, what had happened in Germany. And then here they are weaponizing it to beat Nazi Germany, for that matter, Imperial Japan, with this weapon. And then that war is over when what do you do with yeah. this, right? You have this. And now I think you're pointing to, John, is that we're getting a new development with the hydrogen bomb where it's the fear of war or or the like that's driving scientific innovation in a peculiar way. I mean, but it's, it's, a, it's an unusual dynamic trying to keep up with it. And I think it brings us to a figure like Edward Teller, mm -hmm. we see so much of in the movie, right, where he had wanted to work on fusion during the war right. itself. And Oppenheimer gives him some leeway, but just reminding him we're about, this is about fission, and they're not about fusion. And then Teller, if you will, kind of has his moment. You're kind of pointing to the AEC and Straws and others making the case we need to go the fusion route. Right. The Soviets now have an atomic mm -hmm. bomb. It is basically a copy, correct? Of it's a, it's a, it's a complete copy. Uh, what ha what's interesting is the story behind uh, the Soviet bomb. And there's some really great books out there um, on this topic. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, Klaus Fuchs, who is really the the main spy. There are others, but he is really the one at the center. Uh, of the Soviet effort, he gives them the, basically the design and, and the information that they need. And this is sent to a guy by the name of Igor Kurchatov, who is head of the atomic uh, effort there in the Soviet Union. And Kurchatov is, is uh, privy to this information, but he keeps it pretty much close hold. So most of the Russian scientists don't know where this information is coming from. They just think, oh, we thought this stuff up. Um, and so uh, uh, Latvia Beria, who is basically in charge of the nuclear program on, on, on looking over, seeing Kurchatov, uh, he tells Kurchatov, make the exact copy of the American bomb. Well, other scientists will say, we can build one, the Russian scientists will say, we can build one that is better and more efficient. Barry says, no, because the American one works and we know it works. And so as a result, what you see uh, in the Soviet Union in, in 1949 is, is a carbon copy of that bomb. And so the implosion device that you know, we talk about. But what's interesting uh, about this is that given the Soviet discovery years ahead of, uh, of what we estimated, um, now that spurs this, this race that Oppenheimer's worried about, this, uh, this, this weapons race that we know that comes to actually Pass, but he's worried about this in 1946, and it, and, it, and it happens. And so, in January 1950, Truman uh, approves the the idea of looking at fusion uh, as a technology, fusion as a potential weapon, and a review of national security policy, which becomes NSC 68, uh, which gets approved later on in 1950. But to be reflective of what you're talking about, one of the member, one of the smaller characters in the movie is a guy named William Borden. And he, he uh, works in the Atomic Energy Commission. He's one of the people that really calls into question Oppenheimer's uh, allegiance to the United States. Well, it is true, as the movie portrays it, he was a B-24 pilot. He did see a V-2 rocket fly at night, you know, and it made an impression on him. Well, he writes a book shortly after the war called There Will Be No Time. And basically what he's saying is, in the future, the United States or the Western world will not have years to build a defensive posture like we did in the Second World War. You know, we had the arsenal of democracy, uh, building tanks uh, in the sinews of war uh, in 1942, 1943 to start these big offensive juggernauts that, you know, the American and allied effort have become. What he's saying in the future, there will be no time for that because eventually smaller atomic weapons will be on these V2-like weapons in the future. And so America has to be armed at the get-go. And so this is a new idea. And the reason why this is new is not just because of the technology, but it's new because it's an anathema to the American experience. Well, why do I say that? Here's why. Uh, for most of our nation's history, from its inception uh, all the way up to the Second World War, the American people don't like large armies. One, they're expensive, okay, so there's that. So it's an incredible waste of assets, you know, in terms of what it does to your economy. But second, early on, our founding fathers saw standing armies as a threat 
to a nascent democracy, which of course we have in the in the uh, 18th century. It's a whole new idea. And so we don't want to have a military around because it might threaten the balance of, of a democratic establishment. And so what the United States does is it relies on its militias uh, and, and pulling them together in times of national emergency with small armies. Uh, however, eventually we establish a small standing army. But then when the Civil War comes, we expanded exponentially to fight this internal fight. But then after the Civil War, what do we do? We downsize again. We have a relatively small footprint militarily. And then as the 20th century comes in, as America expands its, I'll call it empire, or, or influence overseas, we'll grow the military a little bit, but not necessarily very large. During the First World War, we'll do the same thing again. We'll build a large military, we'll go to war against the Kaiser, and then immediately after the war, what did we do? we downsize yet again. And it remains that way up until our involvement into the Second World War. And of course, we build up to a you know, 12, 13, 16 million man army, uh, depending on what year you're looking at, if you're counting. Uh, and so we build this very large military. And then what we do in 1946, we demobilize and everybody goes back home and they have 2.3 kids and they live in the, you know, the suburbs, as we well know, uh, and becomes consumer culture and those things that we're aware of. However, here's where it's different. With men like William C., uh, with William Borden, and with NSC 68, what we're saying now is the United States must have a large, standing, and powerful peacetime military. That is a br significant break in the American tradition. That's such an excellent point, John, and the, the film does give us insights into that about how you're going to see this massive national security establishment yes. come about, right? Attached to this, this really kind of semi-permanent, large military, and and this focus on on secrecy that's that's there on on counter espionage and espionage, and on the American side, the fact that once it comes out about Fuchs working for the Soviets, yes. you know, some six months, less than six months after. The Soviets test their first atomic bomb. This kind of fear, if you will, paranoia that connects directly to a figure like Senator McCarthy from Wisconsin. This definitely has no small ties to what happens to Oppenheimer and his whole issue of his security clearance. It's also, I think, worth noting for the audience on the Soviet side, from their vantage point, since the U.S. had kept them out of the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. They themselves are always concerned about what the U.S. Is, is doing. And so there's this kind of dynamic that comes into the early Cold War where neither side, this is certainly true even before 47, can really trust the other in terms of what they're willing to share despite people like Oppenheimer and the Soviets themselves will have, they already have a figure like Beria and a secret police they too will build up this gigantic national security establishment. Uh, they had really built the Red Army. The Red Army, in fact, had been decapitated mm -hmm. during the purges in the late 1930s and then is built back up during World War II, not surprisingly. 34 million people served in the Soviet armed forces. So on their side, they begin to do this too. And this is getting into the comments we see in the film Oppenheimer referring to two scorpions yeah. in a bottle, right? right? That famous comment where there's a feeling that there's less and less room to maneuver internationally, not only for the U.S. and the Soviets, but for other countries, really for human beings in general. They're kind of locked in right. to this dynamic of escalation, of, of arms race. And there's no doubt, I think, John, getting to kind of the last bit of what we want to do with this episode the two developments, and I think no matter where you stand on the Manhattan Project and the use of the atomic bombs, these developments are really frightening developments. The invention of the hydrogen bomb and the timetable there between when the Soviets get a deliverable weapon and when the U.S. gets a deliverable weapon, you mentioned, reminded us, four years between Hiroshima and the Soviets mm -hmm. developing an atomic bomb. The, the much more compressed timetables we get with the hydrogen bomb yes. and then the intercontinental ballistic missile. So by 1957, John, we really are in a situation that is unprecedented. Mm. And, and, and the fact that it's changed so much in just 12 years after, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So 
what would you want the audience to, to know about how you assess this yeah. new era, even within the Cold War, within the atomic age? We have thermonuclear weapons now, and now we have these ICBMs. It's interesting that you bring up this point um, about the, the development. Uh, I, when the decision about thermonuclear weapons is in the offing uh, in the fall of 1949 and, of course, 1950, there's a great quote, and I can't remember who said it, but he says, um, the true fathers of the American uh, uh, super weapon is what they're referred to in terms of fusion, hydrogen bombs, they're referred to as a super. He says, the real fathers of the super bomb are uh, uh, Brian McMahon, who's the chairman of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, uh, Louis Strauss, and the last one is the spy from Los Alamos. So it's interesting you have these three individuals, Klaus Fuchs, those three men are looked upon as, you know, the followers of time. Why? Because two are pushing it, and one gives you, to the point that you are trying to make, this fear of the Soviets getting ahead of us. And the synergy of those events happening. And Klaus Fuchs' arrest is announced the day after Truman signs the document to start looking at fusion as a possible way ahead. And so you can't separate these events. They are all intertwined uh, with regard to how we view the world. And of course, just like during the interwar years where aviation technology grew by leaps and bounds, you went from wooden uh, cloth covered airplanes in the first world war to metal monoplanes um, flying at, at 10, 20, 30,000 feet now with air speeds going up to, you know, 200, 300, 400 miles an hour. And then the war comes and of course it exacerbates the, this idea of technology and you, you drill it to its conclusion where now we have jet aircraft that can fly uh, intercontinentally um, at you know 40,000 feet uh, and have these extended ranges that can carry a 10,000 pound bomb and drop it on a Soviet city. And so you have tech, aviation technology and weapons technology growing by leaps and bounds. And of course, by 1952, you're starting to design what we know today as a B-52 which is still in service today. Uh, and you take that to its next conclusion. By the 1950s, the U.S. Air Force is looking at missiles, as is the Navy in sub-launch missiles. And so you see this progression with regard to technology uh, in the 1950s, um, where as we build these atomic forces on, on both sides, the Soviet Union and the United States, which causes Eisenhower, as you're well aware, to kind of question this idea and bring up this idea of the military industrial complex, because again, this is something new in the American experience. Now, not only do we have enough weapons to defend ourselves, we have enough weapons to destroy the entire world. And so that equation is something entirely new in the history of man. It, John, it really is. And uh, I mean, your remarks, I think for a lot of people, this, these getting into this subject matter just gives one goosebumps because unlike the Cold War does end, we can say around 1990, but the atomic age does not. So the nuclear and thermonuclear weapons are, are still with us. And we see in the mid 1950s, once you have something like a hydrogen bomb, what is it? 20 million tons of TNT, something like that, the equivalent of, and this one of these weapons, you think what little boy or fat man, the, the damage and devastation could inflict on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A hydrogen bomb could destroy the entire New York metropolitan right. area, right? Where, where a little boy maybe took care of Manhattan Island or took care, uh, a hydrogen bomb can take the entire, all the 32 boroughs of you know New York uh, to give you this exponential size. And keep in mind, uh, we're gonna build these missiles with thermonuclear weapons that have multiple warheads in them. Your Minuteman missile has three warheads. So once it, it enters the atmosphere, the nose cone comes off, and these three warheads go at three separate targets. You know, it's not just delivering a bomb, it is delivering multiple bombs, you know, at multiple targets. And so again, you have this exponential increase, not only in terms of firepower, but in our ability to deliver these weapons at given locations. And there's so much uh, rich for our audience out there, there's so much rich, interesting, provocative work that was done in the 1950s by people trying to keep pace with these developments and to, to oppose them, ultimately mm -hmm. to oppose them. I'd just like to mention two of them here, kind of at the, the end, make people aware of. One is this manifesto that 
is signed by Albert Einstein at the very end of his life. He doesn't write it, but he agrees to it. It's largely written by the philosopher Bertrand Russell, both of them born in the 1870s. So Russell's going to be around for much longer, dies in 1970, but Einstein dies in 1955. And so this text known as the Russell-Einstein Manifesto, they speak of a future overshadowed by universal death. It's this phrase that really does stick with you, this nuclear threat, which is now kind of all encompassing. And they really appeal to people to, to speak to the human being in each of us and not the American or the Russian or the German or the Japanese or the Chinese, etc. that human beings have to unite to stop uh, things from really completely careening out of control and bring about a nuclear war. And this, this text is widely disseminated and discussed in the mid-1950s with the hydrogen bomb already achieved and the, the ICBM right on the cusp of that. Yeah. And, and to your point, um, there are members within the, D the new Department of Defense um, and also members within the, the budgetary uh, elements of the U.S. government that are concerned that with our development of atomic weapons in the 1950s, we are putting ourselves in somewhat of a strategic straitjacket in that this is our only option. So if you're building B-52s and B-36s and B-47s with atomic uh, and fusion-based weapons, now you said this is our only response. And this is a concern for many people in the 1950s. And of course, we know that other things happened. Korea happens. Vietnam happens. You know, then there's a bunch of other, you know, uh, conflicts that occur in the 1950s, not quite as big as those. Um, and so you have this concern about, well, are you going to use nuclear weapons in Korea? Is that really worthwhile? Are you going to use them in Vietnam? Is that really worthwhile? And so when the Kennedy administration comes along, you have this idea as a flexible response that not putting all of our eggs in a nuclear basket, um, even though nuclear weapons were discussed at the end of the Korean War, and there were some people that discussed them in the Vietnam era too, obviously on the fringes. But again, this idea that are we in the 1950s, are we putting ourselves in this strategic straitjacket with no other answers? Uh, for possible uh, deters to aggression. And this is something that weighs heavily, I think, um, on, I on Eisenhower's mind as he leaves office and certainly on Kennedy's mind as he comes in the 1960s. You know, this, this kind of issue of concern, John, for I think for really thousands, hundreds of thousands, you could, I can think even speak of millions of human beings and starting in the 1950s who begin to organize and, and protest about, about this arms race and about this, this complete... It seemed like this logic of of overkill and of of nuclear uh, nuclear catastrophe that's there. You have this Einstein Russell manifesto. There's a figure I work on based in Austria, an intellectual named Gunter Anders. He will talk about in 1956, the year after the Russell Einstein text, a blindness to apocalypse. Yeah, a blindness to this uh, nuclear cataclysm and. Eventually, Anders will coin the term global side mm. is the in, ultimate end game of this global side. And an American philosopher, John Somerville, looking way ahead in the 1980s, will talk about omni side. So the destruction of all life mm. in the Oppenheimer film. We mentioned this last uh, episode too. this kind of scene of Earth ablaze, mm. the immolation of Earth with a nuclear war with these ICBMs, this uh, raining uh, havoc and, and chaos on the human race. That's that's what many of these individuals are pointing to. And I guess the open question for the audience is, is how much Oppenheimer, the film, is pushing some discussion or really igniting some discussion about these weapons and the fact that they're still with us. Thankfully, many fewer of them but, and, and not a situation like we faced in the Cold War, but still yeah. present. It's funny, you're talking about the... the Omni uh, nature of these weapons. There's a great, uh, it might be an, a, an apocryphal story, but it's a great one in the book called Wizards of Armageddon, which I highly recommend people read. And it, the, in the story, there's a, there's a civilian getting a briefing from a, an Air Force officer about the nuclear, a nuclear war plant. 
And uh, the civilians keep asking the same question, well, you know, what's going to be the result? What's going to be the end state of this nuclear exchange? And, and finally, the military officer says, don't you get it? If there's two Americans and one Russian left, we win. And the civilian says, well, you better hope that the two Americans are a man and a woman. You know, they kind of underscore what we're talking about here. And to the point that, that you are making is that we're talking about the obliteration of, of life on this planet as we well know it. Um, and it's interesting when you read some of the the early war plans that have been classified. And it really makes you kind of go, you know, do the teeth sucking thing. Like, we were really thinking about doing these things. And, and, and we were. It was, it was very... Um, uh, very matter of fact in their discussions on this kind of stuff, which gives you an insight uh, to the time that I think we tend to forget, you know, as, as time passes. We do tend to forget, John, and I think Oppenheimer does a great service by reconnecting us to this history. So let me thank you, John, for once again sharing your expertise with us, with the audience, and thank the audience for joining us on this season of World War II On Topic. Please consult our website for numerous articles dealing with this subject matter. And we hope that you'll join us in person or virtually in future events here at the National World War II Museum. We have a very special section on the Manhattan Project and the museum's Arsenal of Democracy section. So thanks very much for all your interest and all your attention.